Hello, hello. Check one, two. Hello, 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 hello. Good morning, everyone. We're all here, and it's uh, Denmark. It's the sun is shining, and it's cold, but it's okay. We are. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome the 11th Jankocon in Europe. That's exciting. You made it. <laughs> Oops. Oops. We are just waiting for the start. Cool. Thank you, man. Welcome, everybody. And uh, my friend Emil here. We are a part of uh, 15 people who have organized for a long, long time. And we are so happy to see all of you here today. <laughs> we have some practical things we would like to say about how this works for the next 15 minutes or so before our first talk. Um, we are some people with uh, some special badges to see us and you need some help, you're always welcome to ask. If you cannot find us, you can go to the help desk where you registered, and uh, that way you will always find someone. We also have a code of conduct that you know maybe from previous Django cons. It's uh, meant to make everyone feel safe and welcome here. And uh, we hope you have uh, read the code of conduct. We have put it on our website. We have put it in the program here. You will find it lying around on some tables. If uh, you have any kind of concern in this regard, there's a team of four people that you can contact on our email, conduct at gengocon.eu or directly by phone. People uh, who are wearing these normal dark blue la lanyards are okay for being photographed. If you would like to swap your lanyard, there are white lanyards in the registration area. People wearing a white lanyard are not okay for being included in photos. So please respect that. And our photographer here will also uh, know about this. And if you are on a photo, it will be deleted. We will look through all the photos and delete the ones where there is a white lanyard. So don't worry if you are in a photo, it will just not come online and if it's online just let us know and we'll remove it. In this program you find a nice little map of, uh, of the venue here. You are now in the main hall. Um, if you need a toilet there would be there are toilets down there. There's a toilet trailer outside in case we have a lot of need and um, <laughs> there's also a toilet up there. Um, there's things to explore, so have a bit of a walk around here. Make sure you visit the upstairs area where you find a quiet room. You also find a nice area with plants where you can relax. And then there's a social area uh, with a lot of tables and chairs. Um, and um, then there's down here on the ground floor, um, laptops and for instance in that corner where you're welcome to, uh, to work. And uh, in the back, there is a wardrobe. And in the wardrobe, you are also welcome to sit and work. Um, we will make sure that uh, the sound from this stage is transmitted into the wardrobe, so you can sit there and follow the action in here. Um, then there is a uh, very nice areas outside. It's a bit chilly today. Um, but uh, you're welcome to use a whole yard out there. And there's a yard uh, way in the back when you go out. Um, you are also allowed to smoke in that yard, even though there is a smoke sign that says no smoking. Uh, it means that you are not supposed to smoke exactly where the sign is, but go a little bit further <laughs> back. Right. 
in the bathrooms, we will put uh, bathroom baskets for all the kind of sanitation needs you may have. Um, and uh, we also have put out pronoun buttons if you would like to uh, uh, make sure that you are dressed in a way that you are comfortable with. Uh, you are welcome to take a button um, and uh, welcome to ask if you cannot find them. And uh, a lot of excitement has gone into a small venture together with our venue. Um, this venue, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a couple of minutes, um, but one of the amazing things that they can do is to print custom-made t-shirts. Um, we'll have brand new uh, garments delivered here, uh, where you can pick from different sizes and different colors. And then you can also bring your own garments, so if you have a t-shirt you would like to have upgraded with a conference logo, a Django logo, or maybe a flying pony, that's what they can do for you. If you don't have a garment, then the tote bag has a handy blank space on the other side. Um, what you do is that you go to our uh, members ticket holder area and you will find a tab called T-shirts. And there you find the instructions to buy a voucher. Uh, when you have done that, you go to the help desk and you pick up uh, the voucher. And uh, the T-shirts will are unfortunately 40 kilometers from here right now, but they're arriving later in the day. Cups and bottles. Um, so this conference, we um, want to like put our green touch now, like sustainability to um, what we're doing and being a bit considerate about the uh, environment. So um, instead of uh, having um, cups, we have to wash. These are like biodegradable cups. Um, put your name on it before before you put. Um, um, hot things in it, it makes it a lot easier to write your name. And then there are stains out here where you can park your cup and you can find it again. The same with the water bottles. Pick a water bottle, um, drink the water, and then there are tabs where you can um, refill them, put your name on them, um, but see if you can like reuse uh, as much as, um, as possible. Thank you. Do I have to say any more? The um, password for the Wi-Fi, DjangoCon Europe 2019. It's uh, missing the, the last bit here for the SSID, and uh, it's also in the program. And uh, the c code is pip install Django, like last year. And amazingly, it works. <laughs> it has been clocked in at 400 megabits on a single wireless connection. So enjoy. <laughs> uh, hashtag JingoCon is the handle if anybody is in doubt about the social media handle. And a bike is this year's emoji. Talk questions. There will be a mic. This mic will be right there. Please come up to the microphone and ask questions. And on the internet, Russell will sit and answer questions as well. So for everybody on the live stream, just ask questions there and, and we will um, answer both from in here and on the internet. Ooh. Thanks, Russell. Um, laptops, silent. Phones, silent, please. Thank you. And it will be live streamed, everything. So um, the stream will start a bit before the talk, and then uh, it will be streamed the whole talk. And we'll also save the talks for later. So if there's something you want to share with someone, or revisit, or missed out on, they will come up online. But this is the link to watching it live. Also on the website, there are directions uh, oh, this is the directions live. There you go. Also, the website is a bit of a living thing, so keep an eye out for changes. If there are changes in the program, that will be there. We can't change the printed program of obvious reasons, so um, please have a look there. Do you want to talk about lightning talks? I do. I love lightning talks, uh, and incidentally, uh, we have lightning talks again this year, uh, and it's the same format. It's the same familiar, wonderful format. Uh, there's half an hour uh, 
every day set aside um, at the help desk registration area. Um, please come with your lightning talk submission. There will be two different buckets, uh, one for first time speakers and one for everyone else. And um, Usually there is a bit of run on like Friday, so if you submit your lightning talk today, it's more likely to um, be um, selected. selected. Thanks. And here's a tip um, to make everyone included uh, when you are standing around in a circle, try to open up a little bit of space in your circle so that others can join your conversation. If someone joins your conversation, then open up a little more space for the next person. You find other tips uh, about socializing in the program and, um, <laughs> and, and now we want to uh, welcome our wonderful venue um, director, Stine, from the Academy for Untamed Creativity, which is quite an amazing partner in this. Welcome to you. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah, that was loud. Um, I think what is pretty amazing is that we were contacted by Benjamin and Emil and asked if we could do this conference. And uh, I have to tell you that this is the biggest event we ever did at this place with the, not the amount of people, but three days in a row, uh, so many speakers, and, and, and that we are super happy that you have the courage and the faith in us to, to make this happen. Um, also, we said yes, because we think this conference and this uh, uh, thing you do is yeah, it's super important for uh, the world and uh, we are happy to support it. Uh, what is the Academy of Untamed Creativity? Yeah, it's uh, actually uh, three schools, it's uh, two associations, it's uh, kids from uh, five years old doing circus in the afternoon till uh, uh, ladies in the 70s doing uh, dance classes in the evening. Uh, it's uh, three schools with um, young people from 16 till 25. Uh, that is not at the moment. Uh, they don't want to go the direct way in the education system, so they uh, maybe need to go or want to go other ways. And the things we work with here is from design to circus to theater, uh, lightning, uh, events, food, uh, painting, skating, things like that. And everything you see here uh, in this room, uh, uh, for instance, is made by the students. For instance, they uh, got this uh, challenge to do your pony. <laughs> but they not only did the pony, they also set the light on the pony and all the other lights and the sound and the room and yeah. They are sitting over there, some of them. Uh, then a lot of students uh, met here at 7 o'clock this morning. Usually they meet 9 o'clock. They met, they started to make croissants, making coffee, set up the last things and so. And they are taking care of you all day. So everyone you meet here from a FUC is either teachers or students that uh, will try to make everything just flow like there's always toilet. Oy. Yeah. <laughs> Whenever you have questions, ask us. We will try to answer whatever, and it counts for all of us in the house. Uh, maybe you sometimes hear funny sounds from in here, by the, uh, behind us. In there, there's a big circus hall, and just a couple of minutes ago, I heard a lot of yelling in there. I guess they had some morning session. Uh, about morning sessions, I have a little thing for you. Because uh, Benjamin, he said to me, ah, I think the chairs are standing a little too narrow if you have to walk up and talk into the mic. So, actually, we're doing, going to do a little exercise. So, Ama, can we have a little light on the audience over there? Yes. And then I want every one of you to stand up. And 
while you're now standing up, you can as well uh, just do a little exercise, which I do with my students sometimes if, if we lose concentrations or we just need to get a little energy. So right now, I want you to, very fast, put your feet uh, against the floor with the hips uh, with between your legs. Yeah, and then just feel your center. Uh, and some uh, some people they are standing like this. This is not a hip width. Uh, it's more like this. Especially boys do like this. I don't understand why. <laughs> okay, uh, <laughs> but you are feeling your feet against the floor. You are relaxing in your knees. You are relaxing in your body. Just do like this with your shoulders. Oh, it's very fast this one. But oh, it's nice. Then you close your eyes. Take a deep breath in with your nose. Really fill your lungs and down to the stomach and just feel the air coming down in with your nose and then breathe out with your mouth. And just stand now and breathe a little. And while you're standing, breathing, you feel your feet against the floor and imagine you're standing on a ball the size of a bathing ball that's completely red and it's full of energy. And now you start sucking up energy from this with your toes. Just your toes, you're starting sucking up energy by tensing, by really squeezing your feet. And then now you start to tense your feet, your under legs, your knees, your thighs, and your butt and your stomach. Now you are completely tense from your stomach and your butt and all the way down. The rest of your body is completely relaxed. So you're really tense downstairs and you really relax on the upper body. Now you start to tense also your stomach, your chest, your lower back, your upper back. You tense your shoulders, your overarms, your elbows, your underarms, your hands, your fingers. And now you also tense your throat, your neck, your face, your hair. And now you tense all of your body. Tense, really squeeze, uh, and relax. Uh, and just shake a little and open your eyes. Uh, okay. So, that was only to make you ready for the next exercise, which is really important. Because we, Benjamin said, we need some more space between the chairs so you can get out. So now, the first row, you just stand where you are. But the next row and all the rows will, will put their chair 10, 15 centimeters backwards. But we have to do it at the same time, otherwise it's not going to work, okay? So, and some of you might need to take two or three chairs at the same time if there's not enough people. So now everyone, no, 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 don't move yet. Take a grab on the chairs in front of you, uh, behind you, yes. No, no moving yet. So now you have your hands on the chairs. And when I say one, two, three, not yet. You lift it or, or just scratch it against the floor. 10 centimeters. Okay. One, two, three. Wow. That was really impressive. It worked. So, with this, I just want to say we hope. <coughs> that you're going to have a really great conference. We hope you have three days of uh, inspiring talks with each other and the people up here. And we just want to welcome you warmly and say we are here for you. If there's something, then just uh, ask for some of the FUG people and we will try to help you. I can say one thing, it's going to be hot in here. Uh, and we can only open the windows when we take away the curtains. So we have to do it in the small breaks. But otherwise we can open the door down there or in the corner. So we will try to keep the temperature as good as possible. Ladies and gentlemen, have a really nice uh, conference. Welcome. Benjamin will now ring the conference open. <laughs> Xavier? Hello, everyone. That was a great presentation. And now for our first keynote uh, speaker of the day and the first uh, presentation of the day, we have Carlton Gibson. Um, Carlton? 
Uh, he'll be, he's a Django Fellow, and he'll be talking to you about how you can become a more active member of this beautiful community we have here with uh, his presentation called Contributing, uh, Feeding the Pony, the pony right there, Contributing Back to Django and How to Make That Work for You. So everyone, please, a big round of applause for Carlton. And he will not be taking any questions after um, his presentation, but he will be more than happy to uh, answer any questions when catch him at, at the breaks or after lunch. So, yep, no questions after the presentation. Thank you. Hello? Hello. Yes, yes, hi. Hi. Is that this? Yep. Yep. Okay. Right. Hello. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, I'm really honored to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, feeding the pony. I'm going to talk about feeding the pony. Who's the pony? Well, Django's the pony. There's the pony. I'm so glad they've made this. This is amazing. Um. <sighs> The idea back in the day was that when you're asking for all these magical features like declarative models where you just, you know, sell them out and, I don't know, automatic form generation and input validation and all these things, that while you're asking for all these magic features, you might as well just ask for a pony as well. Right? The thought was that then we needed a mascot and so, well, the, the Django pony was born. Um, before I go on, it, I kind of think we don't do enough about this you know we should have more t-shirts and more things like that so if you're a, if you're a um a swag making type person let's talk afterwards let's try and make something more happen with the django pony anyway who am i um i'm carlton gibson so i'm a long-term django user i've got a book on the shelf that says something like updated for 1.1 so it's around about then um i've been contributing in the django ecosystem for a number of years i'm a maintainer of django rest framework i help i help there um, I maintain Django Filter, Django Crispy Forms, I've helped out on other things. And along with Marius, for the last year or so, I've been the Django Fellow. Um, what's the Django Fellow? Well, we're contracted by the Django Software Foundation to do the sort of day-to-day -day tasks on Django. Um, we triage the tickets as they come in. Um, so you go on the issue track, you create a ticket, we try and reproduce it, we make sure it's a valid bug or not. We handle the patch review. Um, so you submit a pull request, we make sure that your pull request gets a review as quickly as we can. Um, we merged most of the um, pull requests now. We do security work, so there's a security issue um, reported, we help there, along with other contributors. We do the releases. Um, and it's the kind of stuff that on a project the size of Django, it just wouldn't get done, it just fall behind. Um, and I guess the point about the fellowship program, what's really good about it, is it hopefully lets contributors, that's you lot, do the exciting stuff of contributing code while we do the more mundane stuff to keep the project ticking over. So the talk, um, contributing back to Django and how to make that work for you. Why would you do contributing? I'd say, well, A, it's fun. Right? It's fun doing open source. It's fun working on the patches. It's fun... Um, creating software, right? we like right, creating software, but it's a great learning opportunity as well. It's really, it really 
ups your ability. It's something that well, it just makes you better. Um, sorry. And you can take on a ticket, you don't know what it is, you have to work out what the problem is first of all, you then have to create a, a test case for it, you create a patch for it, you'll get your patch reviewed by, you know, um, big uh, uh, by contributors to Django, and they'll help you improve your code. So it's a great learning opportunity. And if you do it right, and that's what this talk is about, it helps you it helps you get a job, or it helps you get a better job, right? But but how? And that's what I'm going to talk about today. And the big problem is that Django, well, it eats contributors. It used to be called the meat grinder. People would say, oh, we need some fresh meat for the meat grinder. I hadn't heard this. Um, and why? Well, because expectations, right? There's, ex there's bad expectations around open source. Uh, one of those comes to funding. So let's just do a straw, po straw poll quickly. I don't know if I can do it. Who here uses Django in their work in some way? That's okay. That's most of you. Right. Keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. Who keep your hand up if you are in some way senior at your work? Do you have an underling of any kind? Okay, so that's not so many, right? And keep your hand up if your company contributes to the Django Software Foundation or Django West Framework for barring code. Okay, some. Right? Well done, those that, you d that do. Companies don't fund Django. It's not many, right? So all of you use it. Half of you are senior in some respect, and maybe 10% of funding. Why don't we fund? Why don't we fund it? It's tax deductible. Okay, it's one of the best wa ways you can do to improve your hiring process, right? Both in reach to suitable candidates. They hear about you because your logo appears in places, but also in looking credible. A, a, quali a qualified candidate comes to, to your interview and you say, oh yeah, and we support the Django Software Foundation, we support Django S Framework, that makes your company much more appealing. Right. The expectation is we won't pay for it. An expectation almost is that we mustn't pay for it. Um, every time a, a new model is tried, there's a kind of outcry, oh, this isn't free and open source anymore. So the example that comes to my mind is Redis. Uh, Redis have got the core, which is BSD license, and then they recently introduced this the ability to create mo modules that sort of bolt on extra functions. So Redis Labs, who's the company that funds most of Redis development, they created a graph um, database module, and they created a full text um, search module. And they put those under a license, which is, f for me, as a user, is totally open source. I can use those in any product. I just can't use them in if I want to create another database product, right? So they've just tried to protect their position there. And yet, there was an outcry. There was Linux distributions threatening to stop packaging Redis because it wasn't free and open source anymore. And no, I don't, the Redis example is just an example. The, but the point is that kind of reaction whenever people try and make any money out of open source or try and find a way of funding it. It's deeply toxic, I think. Um, now, in the, with DSF, with Django, we're really, really lucky. We're in a fortunate position. Um, but if you didn't put your hand up or you didn't keep your hand up on the funding, I'd like to think hard about that and whether your company can fund the DSF or Django REST framework or any other projects that you depend on. But it's not just funding, it's time, right? There is a, there's a kind of expectation that once you start contributing to open source that you somehow owe the community something, that, when y that you have to be there, that you have to turn up no matter what the cost to you personally, right, that you have an, a responsibility, that you're letting people down. Now, I, I've been somewhat fortunate in that as I was getting involved in open source, I saw people that were massively influential to me and mass have been massively influential to Django. I saw them struggling, and I saw their struggle, and I was able to um, well adjust my own behavior and not, not fall into this this trap. But it's, it's really toxic. And again, this is where we're lucky to have the fellowship program in the Django world because Maris and I are able to do the really the stuff that, would, that really drives you to burnout but we're doing it on a paid basis so it's not so it's fine right? and then hopefully then again you can contribute to the good stuff the writing the code bit which is 
you know, rewarding and a learning opportunity and helps you, you know, helps you get more jobs and stuff. So let's look at the state we're in. Let me just have a sip of water. Unpopular opinion tech edition. Contributing to open source is a privilege only few can afford. Meritocracy my on a similar train, open source is the unpaid internship of computer programming. Right. Here's a graph I showed at DjangoCon last year. It was it shows the commits per contributor between um, when 2.1 was released and DjangoCon last year. It doesn't, the time frame doesn't matter. What matters is the shape of the graph. Because there were 481 commits from 121 separate people, but outside of the core group of the fellows and then half a dozen serious contributors, there's just, there, there aren't very many people. Now it's okay, it's fine, but the first problem with it is it's just not enough. We need more contributors. Why? Because there are 100 or 1,300 accepted open tickets on Django. Now, it's okay, Django's mature, right? It's a state, it, it, it's old, but I think that's a bit too many for me. I think we need to be a bit more dynamic than having, look at the, this line shows over time, right? You see, it never changes. Well, I think we need to be closing some of these, and to do that, we need more bandwidth. We need more people. We need more contributors to come and join us, right? We, we manage to keep Django going. We do well. We add new features. We keep up with all the database updates. But if we had a few more contributors, we could take on that, and we could add more features, too. Um, but the bigger problem is that it's just not representative. right? If you look at across the contributors, well, it's quite white and very male. But if you look at that core, well, it's all it's very, very white and it's all male. right? And that's not representative of the the Django community as a whole. Right? Um, as I say, th it could have been any time. Um, so there's another thing going on with Django, which is um, about a thing called Django Core. So historically, if you contributed to Django and you, you made major contribution to Django, you'd be invited to a thing called Django Core. And it m there's a list of people who are in it, and it makes it look as if the contributor base is 50 strong. Um, but it's not, because most of those people are emeritus, they're retired. They're not, really, they're not actively contributing to Django. And so it's slightly misleading that this Django core thing exists. And it's still not representative, because it's all the old white men that have contributed in the past. Um, so there's a uh, Django enhancement proposal to dissolve um, Django core that will go through this year. And that the governance of Django will probably be replaced by members of the Django Software Foundation who are active on the Django developer list. They will be the people who probably, they will be the people who have the voting rights to, if an issue comes up on Django. So join the Django so Software Foundation and then you can be part of the governance of Django and the running of the technical framework. So that's half the story. Um, we're going to get rid of that um, Django core, and then how do we want to, how, do, how can we can encourage more people to come in? That would be the rest of the story, right? So, I'm not going to talk about the funding problem. We've got the Django Software Foundation, we've got the fellowship program. That's, you know, that it's not perfect. There's more to say there, but that's not going to be my topic. I'm going to talk about the time problem, right? So how can you find time to contribute to Django? Well, can your work help? Let's have another straw poll. Who uses Django in their work? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> right, okay. So who, keep your hands up, keep your hands up. Keep your hand up if at work you are senior in some way, i.e. you've got an underling of any kind. Who's got a promotion in the last five minutes? Because that's more of you. Oh, hang on. <laughs> right. So third question. Keep your hand up if in your company you encourage and allocate time for working on open source. Okay. Hand went up over there. <laughs> that's not bad, right? Because that's what you need to be doing. 
Your programmers, your staff, they will experiment, right? And you can choose. Are they going to experiment on your code base, on your product, or are they going to experiment on an open source package which gets community oversight from experienced contributors? You can choose that, right? It's a great learning experience. It makes your, your employees better programmers. It allows you to keep up to date. So you've, got, you've installed a third-party app, a Django third-party app, and it's not compatible with the latest version of Django because it's got some bug in it. So you have an option. You can either get stuck on the, on the, out, you know, the last long-term support that's just about to become end of life, and then you're running end of life software, and every time you try and recruit a new programmer, what version of Django are you running? Oh, we're on 1.5. Oh. Right. Or you can tell your programmers, yeah, no, let's fix that bug, and let's fix the other couple of other issues on that repo. Let's get that third-party package that we depend on compatible with Django 2.2, and let's update. And then all of a sudden, you're on the latest major version, and that's a happy place to be. Not only for your existing programmers, but for your hiring too. Yeah, what version of Django run? Oh, yeah, we're on um, 2.2. Yeah, we'll, we'll be upgrading to 3.0 when that's ready. Ah, that's an exciting company I want to work at. Right? It's a virtuous circle. It's a learning opportunity. It makes your code better. You get all new features. You can hire more easily. It becomes a learning opportunity. Right? Google supposedly allocates 20% time. I don't know if 20% time is too much to ask. What about 10% time? Would one day every two weeks at working on open source, what your dependencies on the dependencies you use, would that really kill you? If your answer to that is yes, then you've got big problems. So allocate time from your work. But what happens if your work won't help you? Well, what about finding time for yourself? Now, I know this can be difficult. What do I know? Aren't I exactly the demographic that we've just talk, been talking about? Right. So what do I know? Well, I know a thing or two. Because i got four children. Here's what, look. I've got a mountain of children. Oh, I know, aren't they? <laughs> right? And I've done all my contributing on the side. All of it. Around working to support those whilst trying to ensure that I'm a present as a parent. Right? So people have always asked me, well, how do you have time to contribute to open source? And the answer I've always given was, well, some people play Fortnite. I've updated it since last year. Um, I play GitHub. Right? The point here is that I've made a choice. Okay? I don't have Netflix. I don't watch the new series on tel television. My wife thinks I don't like novels. I do like novels. I just haven't read one in an age in the day. Right? It's just that you have to kind of choose what you're bad at. Because you can't be good at everything. So I'm bad at Facebook. I don't have it. I'm bad at Twitter. I do have it, but I'm rubbish at it. I'm bad at so many things that I can't make the time for. That I can't make the time for because I have four children. Because I want to improve my Spanish and my Catalan. And because I like to cook and I like to spend time doing all those other things. And I want to contribute to open source. Right? And it's not much time that I leave. I honestly don't have a lot of time to contribute. Uh, from a you know, for the, so I do the fellow role. And I work on Django REST framework as well on a paid basis. And then I have a little bit of time to do some open source. Okay. But it doesn't matter how little. So you find some time, a little bit of time. Like it would be half an hour a week. I mean it, that would be enough. An hour a week would be twice as much, right? But enough, right? So find some time, and then I want you to immediately limit it. Now, I talked about this again last year. But the important thing with contributing to open source is that you don't allow it to eat more time than you, you have specified. Because it can. And that's what leads to burnout, and that's what leads to all the problems with contributing to open source, is not limiting the commitment that you give. So if you take one thing away, take that. Right? Priority number one is still self-care. Okay? You, you have to look after yourself. There is this feeling, oh, I must fix that issue that I you know, caused an issue by fi merging this bug and that's broken this. And if I don't fix it now, people won't be able to pip it. People can go into their pip file and they can put two an equals and a version number in and pin to whatever version. You don't have to fix it that night. Yeah, you, you can fix it. But 
look after yourself first. Okay? And then the other piece of advice I would give is don't spread yourself too thin. If you've only got a small amount of time, focus on one thing. It's better to focus on one package and do it well than sprinkle your effort everywhere. Okay, so it looks like I do a lot. You know, on paper, I'm a Django Bello, I contribute to Django REST framework, a Django filter. Django filter runs itself. Right? There are virtually no issues and, you know, a few hours every, every major release of Django and it's, it's up to date. Okay? The fella role is separate. The paid time on DRF is separate. Okay? Back in the day, I was working on Django REST framework in my spare time, in the time that I had. I was doing a little bit. And then Django filter was unmaintained. And it, when I first started with Django REST framework, it was just Tom and I went and helped him. And but by the time Django filter needed someone to look after it, there were five people working on Django REST framework, and I wasn't doing very much at all. So I took on Django filter. And I was doing all my work on Django filter. I didn't do anything on Django REST framework for ages because I was busy and I didn't have the time. And then I got Django filter so yeah, that was fine. And Django crispy forms was about to fall over. So I took that one, and I spent my time fixing that, and I was doing that for ages. And then those packages kind of run themselves. Django crispy forms. If anybody uses that and uses Bootstrap 4, then please talk to me afterwards, because I don't use Bootstrap 4, and there's a few, they're not hard bugs, but I haven't got the time to resolve them. They just need help with templates for Bootstrap 4. So if you use Bootstrap and crispy forms, please talk to me, and you can help me fix those. Um, if you want to. And now I've, <laughs> though, but those two packages, they run themselves. And so now I've sort of taken on um, to work on channels so Andrew can step back from that. And all I've got is a little bit of time, you know, an hour a week or so to, to work on it. And I'm going to work on it at the sprints and I'm going to, you know, get fix some bugs that I've been looking at. But on the day to day, all I do is handle the incoming tickets. Is it a new, okay, is this a new ticket? Is it a real one? Most of them aren't. Most of them are usage questions. Right, the key point is that in, in my volunteer role, in the bit of, the, of open source that I do for fun, I've only ever really worked on one thing at a time. Right? And that's, you've got to do, well, you don't have to do that, but I see some people contribute, and they, they, they're just, they're everywhere, but they're not doing anything. And it's like, focus. Anyway. Right. And then the third thing is keep a log. Right, because even if it's only half an hour a week, it adds up. I talked about this last year about being prolific. Right, it's it's not about being prolific in in this week. It's about being prolific over time. Right, it adds up. So the log is like an objective record of what you've done, and it's something you that you can talk about. Right? So getting into open source really changed the dynamic for me when I was trying to get gigs. Because they're always like, oh, you know, can you give us some code samples? Well, no, because everything I've, all my work is private, it's NDA, under NDA. But I open source stuff, it's like, yeah, well, you know, I do this, I do, this, I do the other. And it really changed the dynamic. You keep a log of what you do, and then you can use it. And those silly interview questions that you get, describe time when you've used a pony to solve pressing development problem. Well, okay, it's in my log, and I can fill in that application question, and it, it, I've got something concrete to say there. Okay. You can link to the actual ticket, right? It's not just that I wrote in, in the application that I used Django to solve some problem. Here's the ticket where I did it. That's much more impressive than all the other candidates filling in the same question. So keep, the, keep a lock. And then <sighs> you can also use it to help get a reference come and help me on my package and then over a period of time, I'm going to be ecstatic to give you a referral, especially if you can email me and say, yeah, Carl, do you remember that I've been contributing? Yeah, I do. Look, here's all the things I've done. Oh, and by the way, can I have a reference? Right? Of course, of course. Okay. And finally, the reason to keep a log, and as I get older, this matters more and more, is that it's an aid memoir. Okay, so I've solved the problem, I've learned something, but I can never remember it a week later. But I can just search for it, and up comes the what, I, what I did and the notes I took, and then I've got that solution in my pocket for the future. Um, your log doesn't have to be high tech, it can just be plain tech files in a folder. Your computer can search, right? Don't build a tool yourself. Anyway, 
What did I say? I said, limit your time. Right? Find some time, then limit it. Focus on, don't spread yourself too thin and keep a lot. They're the three sort of tricks. Okay? So, actually contributing. I'm going to tell you how to get involved and how to get hold of us when it's not working. The contributing guide. You'd like to contribute to Django, but you don't know how. This document will explain our process how to get involved. Well, that sounds promising, right? It's not the solution. It's, it's a starting point. But have a read. There's loads of good stuff. It tells you the code style. It tells you how to build the docs. It tells you how to run the test suite. It tells you how to write a, a new test. It tells you how to bisect the regression. There's lots of good stuff in it. Do give it a read. Um, it's brilliant. On there it says, um, join Django developers. Okay, well, you're busy. You haven't got time for another mailing list, I know. And a lot of it's not relevant to you. But that's fine. Join it anyway. Turn off the notifications. It becomes, as you get involved in Django, it becomes more relevant. So check it once a week. Go and have a browse and see if there's interesting topics. Much more important than joining Django developers is Django core mentorship. There's another mailing list. And this is like, well, this is the, we need to advertise this more. But it's a place where experienced contributors are signed up to help you get a start contributing. Right, they're ready there, waiting to answer your question. Don't email it, hi, I'm Fred, I'd like to contribute. Right. Hi, I'm Julie, I'd like to contribute. Hi, I've tried to install the, the test suite, but I can't get it going, and here's the error I get. Give people a chance when you um, email the list. But email us. There's people there who are really going to help you get up and running. Um, so join that. Then you need to get set up with the code. Now, in principle, this is easy. Clone the repo. Okay, git clone. Create a virtual end. Python. End, the end. You've done this a load of time. Install the requirements. Pip install minus R. Right? And run the test. There's a run test. Run, run test. Brilliant. That's it. In principle. Right? Sometimes it doesn't work because, I don't know, you haven't got the right library installed in the right place or something. But if it doesn't work, Django Core Mentorship, I've got this error when I tried to run the test suite. If you can't get it running locally, there's a virtual machine that will run the Django test suite for you with all the different databases. There's a Docker um, set up now as well. So get the Docker box for you. Whichever, whatever works for you. But get the code installed, run the test suite, see what it looks like. Fine. Then once you've done that, you've got to find a ticket. And this can be hard. Remember, there was 1,300 open accepted tickets. Well, where do, I, where do I begin? The docs, the contributing guide says to look for easy pickings ticket. But this isn't going to cut it, because there are 1,300 accepted tickets, of which approximately 13 are tagged easy. Right? Now, we're not using this fag right. But it's not binary. It's not like there are 13 easy tickets and 1,300 phenomenally hard ones. Right? The, most of the tickets are no harder than the problems you already solve every single day in your use of Django. Most of them. Yes, they need a bit of time to work out what the issue is. Yes, they need a bit of your love and your effort. But they're not rocket science, generally speaking. Why haven't they been solved? Well, because there's only half a dozen people regularly contributing on the code base, and there's 1,300 tickets. So there's a lot of opportunities there. Right? Also, if you do start one, a ticket, you'll get input. Like the tickets sit there because there's no activity on them. But if you just pick one and start working on it and comment or put open pull request or something, then the regular contributors will come in and give you help. So just pick one, get started. But you can narrow it down. So by component is one good way. You can go into the track and you can look at the view tickets and you can put by component and you can choose. Now you can't see the, the numbers here, but the graph is the important thing, right? Most of the issues are in the ORM and then the admin and then it goes down. And, but if you, you know, if you want to focus on error reporting, well, there's only 10 tickets on error reporting. So if you were to n narrow your vote, narrow by component, it makes it much more approachable. You're not faced with this wall of tickets. You get half a page. The third biggest area there, this, this one, is documentation. There are lots and lots of documentation tickets. So these are super. If, you, you know, if you've got strong written English, which everybody, you know, most of you have, 
you can find a documentation ticket and you can work on it and you can learn about Django and improve the documentation around Django and really make a difference to the, to, to the, to the community because the documentation is one of Django's biggest assets and it's one of our biggest areas to make improvements. You can also filter tickets by patch needs, patch needs improvement or patch needs test or patch needs documentation. So all the, all the there's, there's, there's lots of tickets that get started, but they never get finished because well, Django's, Django's quite good, right? So it can be quite difficult to get a, a ticket or a patch to the level where it's ready to be merged because if it hasn't got docs or tests, it can't go in yet. But there is a massive opportunity to find tickets that just need some test cases added and add the test cases and bring it forward and then we can, credit you with a co-author, and that's you contributing, and that's an easy, that's a way to find tickets where you don't have to do the whole thing yourself, because normally, the solution is sort of, if there's a pull request open, the, the solution is half there. You've got to start. The other way is to look at open PRs. So there's like, I don't know, 180 or 200 open PRs on GitHub. Most of those have been inactive for quite a while because they got opened, they got some reviews, they, they need improvement, and the original author hasn't had the time to finish them. So you can just look through the PRs and sort of go, oh, okay, and you have to read the comments, work out what the review was, but you can contribute. There isn't going to be a single pull request author who doesn't want help with their stalled pull request. Right, so don't be shy there. Um, how else might you find something to work on? Well, is there a bit of Django that you're using that isn't right? So my first patch to Django was to do with the template um, system. Because there's a piece of code in um, Crispy Forms where it instantiates a um, template without specifying a back end. And in 1.8, that wouldn't work because you needed to specify the back end. But um, there was only one. So it, it's the default Django back end. Say, well, if there's only one, can we just use that? And yes, we can. And so I made a patch and I fixed it. Why was it my issue? Well, because I was the one who had the problem. Okay. The other thing you can get in involved with is other repos. So third-party third apps are Django's secret source. Right? Now I learned on Django REST framework, and there are lots of projects out there that are all under-maintained, that all need a bit of help. If you've got time, especially if you use these packages, I mean, if you don't use them, don't help. Use, you know what I want to say. Right, just get involved and help on a, pack, you know, a package that you use. And that can be more approachable because the cold code base is smaller. As I said, I, I would love some help with boot, bootstraps for support on Crispy Forms. If you want to help me with that, you know, I'm really, I'd be mega grateful. So find a ticket. Then can you help to triage that ticket? Is it a valid issue? What does triage mean? Well, is it a valid issue? Can you reproduce it? Can you come up with a test case that shows the issue in, in hand? If you can, that often that's 90% of the job done. Right, the hardest bit is reproducing it and coming up with a test case, often. Okay. Once you've helped to triage it, well, the other thing you do is submit a PR. Looks easy. Um, this takes time, okay? You first of all, you've got to you do the best you can, then you submit it and you get feedback, and you'll get lots of feedback, a little bit of the formula, oh, can you reformat this here? Oh, you've got a, a blank line here. You've got to, you've got to rewrap the comments, the 79 characters. It, loads of comments like that, plus other code changes. How about we restructure it this way? And then you'll go back and you'll make some changes and you'll get more comments. And this happens. Everybody gets the same, um, the same feedback, and it's all about quality, but it can feel hard, right? But don't take it personally. It's not meant to put you off. It's not meant to be anything other than, hey, let's make this patch really good because that way we keep Django at the standard which you all rely on, okay? If, it gets, if you get into problems, reach out. If you need help, reach out. If you're thinking to yourself, oh, I've started to pull requests, but now I you know, can't finish it, reach out. Django core membership again, okay? It send an email there. On this PR, I've got this review, but I don't know how to handle it. Can you have someone advice? Yeah, no problem. I'm here to help. I'm Carlton Gibson on GitHub. Just at mention me in a comment. I see it. I'll come and check out. Bam. 
You can do it, right? You really can. You are qualified. If you've looked, spent any amount of time looking at an issue, Googling it, looking for solutions, then right then, right there, you know as much about that issue as anybody. Okay? You might think you don't know enough. Oh, I'm, oh this, is, this is too hard for me. But nobody knows enough. Like, I'm not qualified for most of the issues that come up. I have to open up the code base, read through it, try and understand the issue. It's what everybody has to do. Okay. So after after the conference, come to the sprints to do the practicals. I'm going to be at the sprints, and I'm, I'm going to be trying to work on channels, to a few um, thing issues there that I want to close. But whilst I'm doing that, I want to be helping you. So if you're going to come to the to the sprints, I'll be there, and I'm going to be um, just trying to help you get started, help you find tickets, help you do the film put you through these steps as much as I can if you need help. So come do that. And then, well, that's just the start. For me, these are exciting times for Django. Django is mature. It's stable. It's in a really good place. Right? It's the web framework for perfectionists with a deadline. It's meant to solve the web crypt problem quickly. And for all its 1,300 open and accepted tickets, it does that very well for the vast majority of use cases out there. And the bit it doesn't do, well, we're kind of working on those. We want to get those done, right? We have major releases every nine months. We have fellows. We have conferences in glamorous locations. We have an awesome community that's unlike any other I know in tech, right? And we have a whole load of new keen contributors who are just about to go and install the whole base, run, run, run the test, find a ticket, and get contributed. Um, we have a real opportunity to craft the future Django here, to make it relevant for the next 10 years. So, come join us. Come feed the pony. Come code. That's it. Thank you. Listen, I said I wasn't going to take questions, but there's like 10 minutes left. So does anyone want to ask one? I'm happy to. Or not. So we have the question microphone right over there. So if anybody has any questions, please line up. No. Yes. Hey, Daniel. Hey. Hey, it's good to see you. Um, first of all, great talk. Um, <coughs> there's something that I've always uh, sort of stopped me from uh, contributing to Django, and it's this notion that Django's feature complete, that it doesn't need my help. How do I, how do I get around that? How do I find out you know, what needs to be done? OK, so um, you, good question. New contributors or protected contributors, they often come along to the Django developers and say, hi, I'm, you know, I'm Elizabeth, I'm new, I'm gonna, I want to contribute, and I've got this great idea for a brand new feature. And it's like, whoa, hang on. Because it's not that Django's feature complete, but most features now can be put in third-party apps, or if they can't, there's room for features, but it's difficult to find them. But there are loads and loads of bugs to fix, first of all. Right? So first, what I, what I personally would do if I didn't have an issue, but the best way is if I've got an issue that needs fixing. I personally am hitting this problem. But if failing that is to filter by component, find a component you like, and look through the existing issues and see if you can solve a bug or two. That would be the first place. And once you've solved a bug or two, then maybe your feature starts to make more sense. Maybe you see a different w way around it that it doesn't need it. Or It's not that we're anti-new features. It's not that Django's feature complete. It's just to come from nowhere and say, I've got this brand new feature, it's going to be this giant expansion to Django, it's like, ah, that never, never going to work. And that's often what happens. Um, so focus on bugs would be my first. And do a couple of smaller patches to get your feet wet and get involved. Thank you. OK, I'm going to, I, I don't uh, think I'm Russell, do we have any questions from the internet? No. Fine, OK, it's too early in the morning for the internet. 
Fine. Okay, that's, that'll do then. Cool. Thank you very, very much, everybody. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Can I get his slides on there? Ah, awesome. Thank you. All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, morning. Uh, thanks for being here. Thanks for the organizers for running this event. Carlton, wherever you are, this was an amazing keynote. Thank you. Really inspiring. There you are. Um, and also, the venue, give them a round of applause again, because this is just <laughs> fabulous. Right, so today, can you hear me in the back? Good. So today I want to talk to you about um, how we log information these days, how we store information or have information available when we run services in production, and yeah, how, we how I think that we can improve upon that and how we can turn that into something where we can ma gain more information from what we currently do. And before I get into that, let me briefly introduce myself. I'm Max Holterman. I'm a Django Core contributor, even though I've not contributed to the core components for a couple of years now. I tend to be more on the security team and the Django Ops team these days. In my day job, I work at Crate.io, which is the company behind a database called CrateDB, which is for IoT cellular data um, direction. So if you want to talk about that stuff, talk to me and find me. I'm here until the end of the sprints. So let me talk about logging and the problems we are facing today. We have 
applications that are run by or used by hundreds, thousands, maybe even millions of people. And things are usually going smoothly and are usually fine until they aren't. And then you have problems and you have engineers who need to figure out what is happening there and what is going wrong. And well, one of the things they do is they look at log messages and they look at what actually happened there. And the log message that, that we have is what we currently, what's I guess currently common. And the current state of logging, I think, is okay. And I think there's a lot of good stuff happening there. But there's also a lot of stuff that we can improve and that we can make the better. And when we log stuff these days, it's probably going to look, look a bit like this. We import the logging framework from Python standard library. We create a logger. And then we have this text of prose text of what's happening. Like in this example, logging failed because uh, login failed because in connection to an authentication provider, something uh, timed out. And then we pass on the authentication provider. And when this message ends up in the log files somewhere or in log service, it's going to read like this. Like for somebody who has decent enough English, in English skills, they can make assumptions and have an understanding of what's happening. But it's up to them to actually understand what's happening at that time. And because we look at log messages after the fact, after something has happened, maybe hours later because we didn't realize it in time, it's really, really hard to actually figure out what went wrong and what, hap what happened. And in this particular case, for example, the person, the engineer who looks at this message and sees this one message, um, they can deduce that, well, somebody probably tried to log in using some maybe OAuth provider, in this case, maybe go uh, probably Google, and something timed out because for whatever apparent reason, nobody has a freaking clue at that, like, at that point in time because there's no additional information about that. And yeah, this information already provides a lot of or this, this log message already provides a lot of context and information, but it's not actually really helpful, I think, because I think that at this point, our logging is broken. And our logging is broken because when I see this log message, there's a bunch of questions that I would like to ask we're just not going to get an answer on. What was the IP address of the host that this server that the log message was written on talked to? What was the, where did the, did the server try to connect to? Or what was the timeout limit? Was it five milliseconds, five minutes? The five milliseconds for something external is probably far too short. Maybe it's just a configuration mistake. Or how many other attempts were there that were made to talk to the provider? As in, was it an isolated incident or was it something that like happened for hundreds of users simultaneously? And there are even more important questions, I think, like stuff like where were there outgoing connections, aff other outgoing connections affected as well, or was it just this connection to this one service, which as an engineer could give you additional information about um, if it's maybe on their side or is it something on your side? Is there some routing um, that's broken? And were other servers affected? Was it just this one server that failed or was it like your whole fleet of servers? And I think this information we could actually add to those log messages. Like, you can have this message that says authentication to prov um, f to host whatever at point this failed with like time uh, timeout m amount of whatever, and then you have a five kilometers long log message that nobody's able to comprehend because we have all the information that you co could possibly want in there. At which point, I think those pro style messages are just not going to cut it and are not going to help and are not really the thing we should be using these days anyway. And instead, I think we should look into something that's more structured. We should, should add structure to the log or to the log messages that we have these days. For example, look at this. Instead of using Python's framework or logging library, we use a library called structlog, which is structured logging. 
and we create a logger similar to before. And then instead of having this long text, we have event. This event is a string, a short string, that provides the very necessary or the, the very specific meaning that this that that what about what's happening. And then you attach annotations or additional information attributes to this event. All the information you have at that point that you could remotely rem or think that could be helpful. Like the provider name, the IP, the timeout, like whatever you can come up with when you write the log message. And at a later stage when you realize, oh, actually this value would have been helpful at all, start logging it as well. It's easy to just add another value there. And then in the log messages that you see on your laptop, it might look like this. It looks obviously different than this text that we had before. It still, still contains the time, the error level or log level. It contains the event and like all the attributes that you set before. In this case, also the server because the way we configured struct log added the server automatically. And you can do have do other things automatically add automatically. And now that we have some kind of structured data, we can actually think about reusing that in some slightly different way than used to do before. So the I guess the most commonly used structured format these days, in the modern world anyway, and like leaving XML out because that's kind of like the old thing, is probably JSON. So we can have this structured thing, log it as a JSON object into a file or into some log service or whatnot. And then when we have structured data, we can reuse that and throw it into a database like Create, into a database like Elasticsearch, into a database like Mongo, or any of those that can deal with structured data but are not bound to necessary specific, uh, specific schemas. And then with that, we can do something far more helpful than what we have when we look at a million records or a million lines of log messages. We can visualize what happens in our systems. And when you think about that, what you see is what you understand. And thinking about this message that we had before, let's show this graph. Have a brief look at it. The green lines with the three spikes are the successful authentication provider communications, and the yellow ones are the ones that fail. Now, the log message that we saw before is about at this point. Now, can you guess what now happens? Or can you think about uh, some of the questions that I asked earlier? Start like, was it an isolated incident? Well, you look at the graph and you can say, no, nope, it's not because obviously for visually apparent reasons, there are more cases of that error message, of that, that log message, that event that failed, where something failed. And you can see that something one way or not the other way. And I think this is often far more helpful than scrolling through a million lines of log messages. And a picture says more than a thousand words. Because when we now correlate this graph with a different one, for example this one, then as an engineer you might, who has understanding of the environment, you might have a better understanding of the entire setup and a, of have a, can have a good idea of what's happening on a larger scale. Now, these graphs show the total amount of log messages for a given log level. So the blue lines are the debug messages, green is info, and red is error. Now, the blue, blue ones kind of follow the pattern that we had for the green one uh, in the previous graph with three spikes. And that's fine, that's kind of like, I guess, what you expected. And then the green graph, which stays pretty much at the bottom, has a few small spikes, just like common info log message noise, let's call it that. And that's fine. And then until the, the error messages are on the kind of on the same level as the green one, because it's a, um, not the best uh, random data set I generated here, um, 
the red um, error message or the error messages, the error message count, kind of briefly at inclined at 12 p.m. Now that can have all kinds of reasons. Because what you could, when you think about the other graph, that error happened like about at this big spike. What could have happened here is that somebody started a so stage rollout and they deployed the application on the configuration change to a set of servers, a small set. And that set of servers raised a couple of errors, but possibly not enough that triggered the whole deployment to, to stop. And because it didn't stop that, it went to the second stage, which you can see here. It increased again, but maybe it's still not enough for the whole thing to fall over and to stop. So the deployment automation just went all ahead, deployed the code to everything, and well, there you are with like your whole application failing and nothing working anymore. Now this is something you can see. You look at this graph and then see something is wrong. And you don't need to scroll through your million lines of work messages. And this is knowledge an engineer can gain by looking at something without spending hours of time on figuring out what's happening. Especially when you have stuff like automation happen, having these visual insights in your software kind of provides a lot of valuable information sometimes. And this is not really possible. I mean, to some degree, sure, but it's not really possible to do with like the, the, the good old like pro style messages. Now, all the things we've talked about right now were like this, this system where you have your one application maybe running on multiple servers that does things. Now think about the micro or macro service infrastructure that you have. And think about the thousands of, or maybe not thousands, but dozens or hundreds of services that talk to each other. And this, this microservice framework, or uh, make microservice architecture that you build because your boss thought, thought that uh, like microservices were a cool idea and it's like the best idea ever. Who of you think that the microservices they or microservice or microservice architecture they have actually is like stable and they have like, services that when some one service falls over it doesn't like make the whole thing blow away blow up? Anybody? I see one hand up there in the back. Good, on, good on you. Happy you. Um, because I, th I think that um, a lot of the information we currently have and that we currently do with logging is not giving us actually the information that we need in order to figure out why, why when one service falls over, why it actually falls over. Because you have this one service that talks to another, that talks to another, that puts something in a queue, that's done, then worked on by some workers, that do then something else. If anything in this chain fails, how does the services dep that depend on that actually are able to deal with that? And I think a very big part of that is not being certain how the events that happen in our systems actually correlate to each other. So are you able to trace that this one thing a user did on, their on your front end actually, are you able to figure out that this thing caused this thing to not work in the back end somewhere? Maybe because they entered some value some weird email address with a whatever a plus sign in the before the ad, um, and all of a sudden your entire billing process dies because you have some broken error handling there. Like if you, if the service dies and you don't have any tracing in there, it's you go, you're gonna have a very 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 interesting time figuring this out. And so the the thing I'm, I'm I want to propose here is to do something called um, event tracing. So essentially, the very first time you see a request come to your system, you give it a unique ID. Python's UUID f uh, f for, for example, is quite sufficient for that. It's unique. It's pretty much globally unique. You attach it to this first the, to the request the first time it comes in, and then every single time you lock anything ever, you attach this trace ID to this lock. And because you have structured logging, 
we can just add this attribute. Um, and you can even go further because then you pass this trace ID on to the next service, on to the next, on to the next. You put it in the queue, the your salary worker is going to figure this out, f see, oh, there's a trace ID. I should probably attach that to all the log messages I write as well. And then when you see this one thing failing, you see trace ID, and then you can go and look at all the log messages that have this trace ID. And then you can see the whole flow of how your whole data flew through your entire architecture. And with that, you can actually understand why some service failed because somebody something happened somewhere else. And well, we are Django con, so I better show some code that's related to Django. Um, so we have the structured library, we have uh, the logging frame, uh, the structured logger, and this is a middleware for that you just put as middleware in the first first middleware in your um, in your settings. And what it does, it attaches the trace ID to a request to the request object, and it either takes the request ID from a header, a trace ID, or it generates a new one. So if a request comes in from the outside world and you do proper filtering on headers, like all the security nonsense you, no, not nonsense, all the security things you actually want to do, um, <laughs> then, you, um, then you can ascertain that, this log m that the trace ID is generated by you, by yourself, or that when you talk to the service um, from other services in your backend, then you can ascertain that this actually is one of your trace IDs. So it's either a new one or some uh, trace ID that comes from, because it's a request from one of your other services. You create a new um, logger here in in, um, in uh, the middleware. That's some um, struct log internals. It's a thread local um, behavior, I guess. Um, and this one with this trace ID equals request trace ID here, you will ascertain that everything that happens within this request will have this log, this trace ID attached to it. Every single log message ever until the request is terminated or the next request rather comes in, at which point it's going to have a new trace ID. And then similarly, you can put something after the um, authentication middleware, for example, and you bind the user ID on the logger. So everything from that point onwards will include the currently uh, the user ID of the currently logged in user, or no trace ID at or no user ID if um, the user is not authenticated. Now we're in the EU. We have a whole bunch of interesting relations. And thinking about DrangoCon last year, there was this four-letter thing called GDPR. So. Um, Logging data these days is actually pretty fun, or actually pretty s something you really want to think about what you do. For example, you never ever want to log secrets. Hello Facebook, hello GitHub, hello Twitter. Um, if you want to have your company's name next to that, please do that and like lock users' password or something. Um, I recommend you do don't do that. It's bad practice actually, as uh, so I've heard. <laughs> um, also, you kind of don't want to accidentally expose all the logs that you log to your to the outside world. Like stuff like S3 buckets are very, very good at being publicly readable or possibly even writable. It's a really great idea to have that. Um, similarly to something called MongoDB, um, which is like one of those, I don't know why, but when you read certain newsletters, this is like every week there's somebody else who had the public accessible MongoDB. Um, I mean, I never say never, but so far I've not had that. I think something fell over there. Um, and then, yeah, be explicit about what you log. I guess that's the more important part about the, um, the GDPR thing. Don't do, uh, do the first one, like set explicit attributes that you want to have, that you want to log to your log files and you have end up in your log system. Don't do the latter because you have no freaking idea what's actually on this object. Or it might not just work. Um, right, so with a bit less than 10 minutes left, who the heck is Frank Taylor Jr.? <laughs> um, let me answer that with a slightly different question. 
Who here knows the movie Catch Me If You Can? Okay, not everybody. Let me give you a brief run through. It's a, the main character is a person called Frank William Abagnale, and he figures out a bunch of cons, where he cons banks, airlines, airports, hotels, like all those like interesting companies and organizations where you can make money, or can save money rather. And the problem is that nobody's actually really able to trace him until some point. And one of that uh, reason is that he, why he's n nobody's able to trace him is because he figured out how, or he was smart enough to, to cover his tracks. And he figured out how to like work around the US um, check routing system by forging checks and having them routed through the whole country. And the thing is that when you th take this like example from the real world and apply to something, to some like microservice architecture maybe, then if you are able to trace events across your entire system, you can actually figure out who did what and what happened and why. And I think the key here is that with proper logging and more smarter logging that we currently do in most cases, I think, um, we can gain far more information and can get uh, much, yeah, get much more intelligence about our users, about how our system is being used, about the resilience of our services. And yeah, this is, I think there's a lot of gain by going into a more structured logging approach. And at this point, I wanted to go with a it's a more live demo, but didn't actually have time to finish that. So also, I'm freaking scared of live demos on stage, and I promised myself never do that. So I quoted an example. There's a code on GitLab. If you want to run this thing, it's a Docker Compose setup. Um, we essentially replace this, this um, catch me if you can thing a bit. You have an Nginx startup page, index page that you can visit there. Comes up with a, there's, a, there's two banks that you can uh, deposit money and wire checks and wire, tra wire money from one person to another. Um, there's an airline where you can book flights. Um, there's a Grafana dashboard where you can then see all the events that happen in the system with like how this wire transfer from one bank to another flew through the system or how this check that you s used to pay for this flight ended up at this bank, but because that's a local bank and then needed to go through the other side of the country and then like all those events, this event tracing kind of being a bit mocked and like, like abstracted here. And then you can also go and like look at the raw database here and like all the log, raw log events and um, yeah, have a look and see or play around and uh, yeah. That's the example. Um, now I forgot what I wanted to do. I actually wanted to make this repository public. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I got to do that right after the talk um, or while you prepare for a question. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, do we have any questions? Again, please line up at the microphone. Hello, Marcus. Um, thanks for the interesting talk. Um, in a typical stack, we not only have our Django application, but also Nginx, MicroWhisky, Postgres. How would we go about sharing or correlating the logs, not only the trace ideas, but the time stamps a way of having the same name for the same fields all over. Are you aware of any standards or initiatives to have a consistent naming scheme for uh, structured logs or? I think it highly depends on how actually you build your Microsoft architecture. Is it like one team or maybe a few, very few teams that build the whole thing of 20 services or is it like 50 individual teams that each have their own thing that 
where they publish an API and that's about it, the, about the communication between them. In the former um, sense, you can probably go and like set some standard. This is what we call these fields, or this is a best practice on how, how fields are called. Um, for example, always include an underscore ID if it's the ID of an object. And um, yeah, if it's the individual teams, I think it's much harder to, I mean, you should still enforce certain things there, but um, also if you have individual teams, you don't wanna take too much of the um, uh, independency of, um, away from them. So this is, I guess it depends a bit on the particular case there. Um, of your organization. Okay, thanks. And I guess at the whole internet community level, nothing exists that yeah. you're aware of. Yeah. Okay. Um, to expand a little bit on the previous question, uh, JSON and structured logging is like a little bit going in both directions. Because if you're saving JSON into a database, what kind of structure do you have? How can you still search in it with a while being um, performant? I mean, you said you don't want to impose too many rules, but on the other hand, if you have like um, 200 different log messages with different fields, how are you going to search in them? How are you going to find anything again? Um, so the, the JSON output is more a thing to have a structured way to write it some way in a, in a log file or something that's then being picked up by a f whatever Fluent D or, or a file B or something and thrown into a more or less schema as database or a database that can handle dynamic schemas. Um, as I said, it's, I think it's uh, highly dependent on, on the application or on the environment where you build in with your system. You probably want to have some enforcements um, at, at, the, at some point anyway. But um, th I think there's also just a bunch of best practices that just exist. That, um, like you, things like um, you call if it you, you call it what it is, not what you think it should be. Like if it's if it's an ID, call it an ID. If it's milliseconds, call it milliseconds, not something arbitrary. Like um, I guess it's if you think about it from a when you look at the more ops perspective, like Prometheus in that direction, they have a couple of best practices on their, um, on their page how to name metrics, like include a base unit, for example. Um, this is probably something that a good recommendation that you can do, but yeah, it depends on, I guess, highly depends on the organization. Hi, Marcus, that was a very interesting talk. Uh, it's a, a bit of a continuation to the previous question. Uh, a lot of places we're, where we use more than one server in parallel, even if it's not uh, microservices, you use some sort of logging servers. A lot of those are using the ELK uh, stack. And um, I was wondering if, if Stracklog has any integration with that that can make it um, be easier to use. So Stracklog Struct lock more plays more as the role of a let's call it a replacement for the st Python standard library, and then you log it to a file and have file beat or whatever does uh, fluent D and throw that in whatever data store you have. So it's um, you wouldn't do that within the request, for example. You wouldn't handle like this rock into a data store as well in the, in the request. It would just take too long. Do we have any questions from the internet, Russell? Okay, then that's it. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you. Thank you and we will now have a break until 11.15. There's coffee being served outside. Thank you, see you back in a bit. <laughs>